Hello everyone and thank you for joining us today. Welcome to Megger's Monthly Testing Tactics webinar series. Today's topic is Fundamentals of Power Factor Testing and Advantages of NBDFR. My name is Michael Fleischer and I'm the Digital Marketing Specialist for Megger. I'll be acting as the moderator for today's presentation and supporting you on any technical issues or questions for our presenter. On the right side of your screen, you will see a control panel that looks similar to this one. You can submit questions at any time during the presentation by typing in the box highlighted in red, and I'll read the questions out during the Q&A segment at the end of the webinar. All webinar attendees are eligible to receive one NIDA CTD and one PDH or .1 CEU for attending. You will receive this in an email within two business days of the webinar. That email will also include a copy of the PowerPoint presentation and a link to a video recording of the webinar if you'd like to watch it again or share it with your colleagues. Remember, you can ask questions at any time during the presentation and they will be answered at the end of the webinar during the Q&A session. Our presenter today is Jill DuPlessis, Technical Marketing Manager. Also to assist with a uh, question and answer session, we will have two panelists joining us today. Dinesh Chajir, Technical Support Group Manager, and Dr. Diego Robolino, Mega Principal Engineer. Okay, well, let's go ahead and get started. Thank you for joining us today, Jill. Yeah, thank you, Michael, and a warm hello to everyone. I'm really pleased that you could join today's webinar. Um, since power factor testing and narrow band DFR testing are both dielectric screening tests, we will start today with a look at electrical insulation. Um, and also take a peek at the insulation inside of a transformer. As one of the most widely known electrical dielectric screening tests in use today, we will discuss the fundamentals of power factor and briefly how power factor data is analyzed. We'll then explore the opportunities that have been known about for some decades by which it's possible to extend the screening capabilities of a power factor test which segues nicely into a discussion about narrowband DFR testing, as well as individual temperature correction, or ITC. Um, my goal is to finish the presentation uh, with a summary within an hour, uh, so that we have plenty of time for questions. So let's begin with a look at electrical insulation, or more specifically, dielectrics. <clears throat> First, I want to preempt this by clearing any confusion that I may cause when I use uh, the words dielectric in some cases and insulation in others. They're used interchangeably because a dielectric is an insulator. As the use of the term dielectric though conveys specifically that the material will support an electrostatic field while prohibiting conduction. Insulation meanwhile has many applications so when you use it without context, you could be referring to any one of these. For example, applications of insulating materials include electrical uh, uses, thermal, acoustic, or sound absorbing uses. IEEE defines insulation as a material or system of materials that provides electrical isolation of two parts at different voltages. As most of you know, if both a difference in potential and a path exists between two points, current can flow. Highly conductive materials that are placed between two su such points will promote current flow, while a di dielectric will restrict real current flow. So electrical isolation means that uh, resistive current is held close to zero. And this type of behavior is very effectively modeled uh, by the use of a capacitor. Insulating materials prevent real or resistive current flow, and they support an electric field best when they are free of contaminants, when they're dry, when they're relatively void free, which by the way, emphasizes the importance of a satisfactory oil impregnation. Um, keep in mind solid um, paper, like papered uh, insulation in a transformer has inherent voids. So it's important that these oil, that oil fills these voids completely to avoid breakdown of the field across them. Um, and dielectrics further work best when they are subjected to voltages and temperatures that are within a range for which these materials are prescribed. The major uh, enemies that undermine an insulating material's continued good performance are temperature, water, and, and oxygen. <clears throat> Excuse me. Areas of localized overheating um, can sometimes result in a localized dielectric problem 
um, where in such cases the materials throughout the rest of the system can retain their starting properties. Localized problems are a far greater concern than widespread deterioration, but and unfortunately, they're, um, the localized problems are, are much harder to detect. Dielectrics fail or reach their end of life when the stresses across the insulation system meet or exceed the system's dielectric withstand capability. Um, the, this figure illustrates this point. It also introduces the concept that we have some control over when dielectric failure occurs. The design withstand of a system represents the, the threshold. It's, it's the blue line that you're looking at. Um, you're, you're never going to, to get better than, than this. But testing and maintenance allows you to influence the actual withstand curve, for example, by drawing a transformer when it's necessary or reconditioning the oil if, if that's called for, repairing leaking gaskets on the transformer, et cetera. And to some extent, <clears throat> the stressors may be down here, may be, may, be, may be managed as well. So for instance, you can control the temperature a transformer sees by controlling the amount or managing the amount of load you're putting on that transformer. Um, moisture, which affects aging as well, may be controlled again by uh, choosing not to operate the transformer in a very wet condition. By the end of the day, to make timely and impactful decisions that maximize the life of your asset requires situational awareness, and this is what testing affords. <clears throat> so um, how do we verify dielectric condition? From an electrical perspective, electrical testing perspective, what we have to do is create a difference in potential across the insulation system and, and see then how the material performs. In fact, all electrical dielectric tests involve uh, applying a voltage and then, and then assessing the material's behavior. So how much real current is measured then between these points, because that would be indicative of the losses occurring in that material. And how much reactive current is measured, that would indicate the amount of energy being stored by the insulation. And at the end of the day, does the electrical performance meet our expectations? If we take an oil approach, we can take oil samples, uh, assuming it's an oil-filled asset, of course, and test its quality and test for levels of dissolved combustible gases as a means to verify dielectric health. The primary insulating dielectrics in the transformer are mineral oil and mineral oil impregnated paper. So if we create a potential difference across the transformer's insulation system, the question is, does this one test validate insulation health? Let me just move this out of the way. And the answer is, well, not, not quite. This illustration is a cutaway that gives a general sense of the components inside of a transformer. And power factor um, testing assesses CHL, C high to ground, C low to ground insulation components, as well as C1 and C2 in a bushing. And I find it helpful to take a look at each of these systems and materials in a transformer, and then we can assess what other systems in the transformer remain that aren't accounted for in a power factor uh, test. So first off, CHL is called the interwinding insulation. It provides electrical isolation between energized high and low voltage windings. And it's comprised to a large extent of paper. And as a consequence, moisture um, in the transformer is, attra is attracted uh, to, this, to this region since paper has such an affinity for moisture. Um, you can see the press board barriers here. And these are separated by winding sticks that in turn create cooling ducts for oil to, to flow in the transformer or through, through that region. <clears throat> so next we have the low to ground insulation. This provides electrical isolation between the energized low voltage winding and points at ground potential, for example, the grounded core. You can see uh, the core laminations in the center of this illustration here. In both of these illustrations, uh, we're showing core form construction. And in core form construction, the low voltage winding here is wound closest to the core. The materials that exist between the energized low voltage winding and the core include, for example, 
uh, high density uh, winding tube and then winding, I don't know if you can see these winding sticks that are glued at certain intervals around the tube and some oil. So the paper insulation on the low voltage windings is included in the measurement as well. Uh, however, the insulation that, that separates the, um, the winding turns or each turn of the LV winding is not included. This is because we short circuit the winding terminals um, of, the, of the low voltage winding in preparation for a power factor test. And in order to test insulation, remember, we have to create a potential difference across the material. If we don't create a potential difference, then there are no electrical characteristics to measure. And then finally, um, the low voltage bushings are included in uh, the CLG insulation system as well. Uh, a difference in potential is created across the low voltage bushing insulation uh, every time we energize this uh, low voltage winding because those bushings provide passage of the energized winding through the grounded, uh, grounded tank. Okay, moving on next, we go to the CHG insulation. Uh, and this provides electrical isolation between the energized high voltage windings and points at ground potential such as the grounded tank. Um, again, we're showing core form, two examples of core form construction on the slide. Um, and in this construction, the high voltage winding is typically uh, in the outermost concentric position uh, wound furthest from the core. So in the photograph here, the actual high voltage winding is, uh, isn't visible to us. Rather, we're looking at a paper overwrap. Um, but this, um, this insulation is included in the CH system, as well as <clears throat> as well as the paper on the high voltage windings themselves. Again, with the exception of the high voltage turn to turn insulation, since the high voltage winding is similarly short circuited during the power factor test. This wooden support lattice uh, that's used to die down leads exiting or entering the coil package um, is included in the in the insulation system as well. And then, of course, a large volume of oil is part of this insulation system, as well as the insulation of the high voltage bushings. <clears throat> now, even though HV bushings are included in the measurement of, of, of C high to ground, and LV bushings are included in the measurement of uh, C low to ground, an important premise of power factor testing is segmentation, uh, which means always test the least amount of insulation at once as possible. That way, the sensitivity of the power factor test to a problem is greatly enhanced. And for this reason, whenever bushings are equipped um, with a uh, potential tap, or as shown here, or a test tap, uh, which will be located directly above the mounting flange of the bushing, then separate power factor tests should be carried out on, on each bushing. And the two main insulation components of a bushing are C1 and C2. C1 um, illustrated uh, next to the physical representation of the bushing is the, is the main uh, core insulation or the active part of the bushing, the part that's supporting the electric field. While C2, which isn't really, really shown except for on the dielectric representation, um, that, that's more the tap insulation. And while most of the insulation included in the C2 uh, um, system may not see much stress in service. When problems such as moisture enters a bushing through, for example, a compromised uh, top gasket, C2 is often the first area where the contaminant appears. So its measure may provide some early detection capabilities. Now we're, we look at, okay, what's, what's left? These are, these are the insulation systems in the transformer that are not um, entirely assessed in a power factor test. So we'll start with, uh, in the upper uh, left-hand corner here, the core ground insulation. So the transformer's core is made up of thin laminated sheets of stacked magnetic steel. And the lamination is an insulation that serves to break up the path for, for eddy current flow through the core. The sheets are band banded together once they're stacked and once the winding packages, which are not shown here, are lowered onto the core, this clamping structure um, is applied. Uh, the core sheets are insulated though, so isolation from ground is still maintained. And then the manufacturer 
specifically installs a ground connector from the core to a ground potential. Now, I put an asterisk here because in all fairness, if that core ground were to lose connection to ground, um, I would be able to see this in a, or at least I could uh, potentially see this in a power factor test whereby my CL capacitance would suddenly decrease. It would just like cut in half or something. Um, however, if my goal is to lift my core ground and test this core insulation in my transformer, uh, an insulation resistance test is really the test I should use. Another insulation system that's not assessed in a power factor test because it doesn't see a difference in potential is this insulation between the phases, so this interphase insulation. <clears throat> and I included a double asterisk here because I do recall a case where Turing had occurred on, um, sorry about that, where Turing had occurred on the bottom most area of the barrier boards at the base of the coils. And this was visible in the CH test results, but that was really down here at the bottom. If we're talking uh, tracking of a barrier board between phases in the middle region only, then this would likely go unnoticed because it's not stressed in a power factor measurement. Uh, you'd have better luck with an excitation current measurement or partial discharge testing to evaluate this region of insulation. And then we've already mentioned the fact that turn-to-turn -turn insulation is not included in power factor testing. Uh, excitation current and TTR, transfer turns ratio tests, are important dielectric screening tests uh, required to check the integrity of, of this insulation. Finally, we have strand insulation. Uh, if I were to cut back the paper insulation of a winding conductor, I would see that it is composed of several individually insulated strands. Furthermore, I would observe that the strands are transposed, meaning that no one strand occupies the same position within the entire length of the conductor. Each strand continuously moves, um, and this is to control losses. So if two or more strands short together, this effectively reverses the efforts taken to control these losses. And the only test in which this type of problem is relatively easy to see is a test known as frequency response to stray losses, which was introduced sometime back in the 1960s, I think. So um, what, do we, what do we really need from a, a test in our day-to-day -day operations? I mean, ideally, it would alert us to the problem. Um, equally important, it would assure us when all is well. Um, and allow us to forego running diagnostic tests until they're necessary because diagnostic tests are tests that pinpoint and define problems. And we don't really need all that information when the insulation is, is healthy. And obviously, we'd be looking for reliability in our, in our test, effectiveness, repeatability, and ideally one that casts a wide net is efficient to perform, et cetera. And when I talk about all these, uh, these, uh, yeah, wishes, I'm really describing the concept of a screening test. Um, when I provided that figure a few slides back that depicted the points at which dielectric failure occurs, well, screening tests are the type of test that provides that situational awareness uh, that's necessary to maximize the life of your asset. <clears throat> it would be tempting at this point to ask, well, how good is power factor as a screening test? But we haven't properly introduced it yet, so let's Let's hold off on, on talking about that just yet. So just how many screening uh, tests exist to test the insulation in the transformer? Um, and again, please note that I'm saying screening, not diagnostic dielectric tests, which would then extend the count. Here is the list that's given in order of when each test was introduced for use on transformers. And I hope I've given you an idea at this point that a single test is really not sufficient to screen for all dielectric problems in a transformer. <clears throat> now, on this next slide, uh, I have plotted out a timeline of just the electrical screening tests for insulation. So in that previous slide, I, I did have DGA and oil quality, um, but I've left those off because I'm just, I'm just accounting for the electrical uh, screening test for insulation. Um, so of course, first came insulation resistance 
and polarization index testing, <clears throat> followed by TTR testing in the 1920s. And then the, a device was in, introduced uh, circa 1910 that would pave the path for power factor. This was the condenser or capacitance graded bushing introduction. Its construction effectively creates a series of capacitive layer as, as its main core insulation, and this is done for voltage control. <clears throat> well, by the mid-1920s, oil circuit breaker manufacturers were becoming increasingly frustrated because brand new um, breakers, I mean bushings on their breakers that had been tested using insulation resistance methods were failing really soon after being energized. <clears throat> so while insulation resistance testing is really effective in picking up contamination, in a multi-layered insulation system such as these bushings constructions, um, it's not able to pick up localized contamination. An easy way to remember this is if we considered the symbol for a capacitor. Uh, so it's just kind of a hand-drawn sketch like this, but it looks like that. Uh, and remember that a capacitor's behavior models how a perfect insulator behaves. Um, well, a capacitor blocks, blocks DC current flow. Uh, so you see here, DC current flow gets to the capacitor and it doesn't go any further. It doesn't allow it to pass. So in a bushing, a capacitance graded bushing construction with these series capacitors, uh, comprising the main core insulation, um, the, as an inner layer on this starts to deteriorate, we've we highlighted this one here, DC can't see this because it's buffered by that first good layer. But AC current, right, this is a good visual way to remember this, AC current passes through just fine. <clears throat> so because of its great success in screening for problems in bushings, the use of power factor for other applications became very popular. And the benefits of using different magnitudes of voltages in a power factor test were explored in the years that followed, as were the things that could be learned should the frequency of the, volta of the voltage uh, test signal be changed. And this brings us to where we are now, heading into 2020, um, where when power factor testing is performed at several different frequencies so that we're able to screen for problems better. <clears throat> So let's have a look uh, now at some of the pr practicalities of a power factor test. And so generally, how does power factor testing work? Well, suppose I have this uh, interwinding insulation in this transformer here that I want to, accept, uh, to, uh, to assess. First thing I need to do is uh, de-energize the transformer. So I do that, and then I prepare for the test, which uh, include short-circuiting the winding terminals of, e of each winding. Uh, and then I need to uh, create that potential difference I've been talking about across these materials. So I apply an AC test voltage of 10,000 10, volts, and the in test instrument is going to assign that a phase reference angle of zero degrees. And then the test instrument measures the total current through the insulation system. And that includes not only its magnitude, but its phase angle as well. Uh, and so with this information in hand, the test instrument can then resolve that total current into its two vector components, uh, which would give both the resistive current, uh, real current shown, shown in red here, um, and this capacitive current shown, shown in green. And from those two values, capacitive current and resistive current, additional electrical data can be calculated. So <clears throat> this includes losses, um, which are, are um, based on the resistive current being measured. Uh, it includes capacitance, which is directly related to that capacitive current measurement. And power factor is calculated by the ratio of that real current divided by total current. And if you look at what that means, real current divided by total current on the vector diagram, you can see that that's the same as the cosine of the angle that separates them. So that's another way to calculate power factor. Additionally, if you want to calculate dissipation factor, that's simply resistive current over capacitive current, or also better known as tan delta. Um, but what I can see from this equation, amps over amps, is that power factor is dimensionless. It's a number an index, 
and it simply represents the system's losses relative to its overall size. Um, Power Factor is able then to rank the efficiency of the insulation system on a scale. And for Power Factor, that scale is zero to 100%. Uh, zero would indicate a completely insulating system. Um, Power Factor describes the amount of energy lost by the system relative to the total energy to which it's subjected. So how efficient is it? Does it, does it lose zero percent of the energy that it's subjected to? That would be ideal, although that's not a very frequent uh, situation. Um, and then lastly, I would just say with power factor, uh, this whole concept of relative losses is actually one of the strengths of this electrical characteristic. It, it's what puts it, pushes it in value above uh, looking just at reported losses themselves. Um, because this allows a user, when you don't have to worry about when the size is already considered for you, it allows a user to directly compare different size insulation system and know which one is performing more efficiently. <clears throat> so just to drive this, uh, this point home um, and give some perspective, Say I have identically sized insulation systems and I measure identical losses. It's easy to recognize that both of these systems are in the same condition. Um, but similarly, if I have identically sized insulation systems and I measure more losses in the system on the right, it's easy for me to conclude that the system on the left is in better condition. In the case where I want to compare the health of different sized insulation systems, if I know that the system on the right is four times the size of the system on the left, but I measure the same amount of loss in each, then I know that the system, oops, sorry about this. I know, gosh, just, there we go. I know that the system on the right is in better condition. However, if I measure loss in the right-hand um, system, that's four times the loss measured on, in the system on the left, then I can conclude, conclude now that they are in the same condition. But where these examples are unrealistic is assuming that I can quantify the sizes of my insulation systems in the first place because I actually can't. And so if I have a situation uh, where, for example, like this, where I know the system on the right is bigger than the system on the, the left, I can see that. Uh, the question is, does the size of the right-hand system explain and account for, does it fully justify the increase in loss I can also see? And the answer is I, I have no idea how much loss is added relative to how much size is added, and I don't have the ability to measure this. So having an index like power factor that reports relative losses uh, is really handy. So power factor uh, is sensitive to contamination and deterioration. Most insulation systems though have some level of inherent loss at the beginning of their lives. So power factor of a new asset doesn't typically start at 0%. And by the way, power factor is typically reported in percent because it's usually a very small number. Power factor is performed at line or mains frequency and therefore reports relative losses generated at an asset's operating frequency. Um, now I say, I asterisk the at because um, people may get confused that O oh, is, you know, performing power factor at multiple frequencies. I've been doing that for a long time uh, because some, uh, because of one way to deal with electrostatic interference at a, at a, at a mains frequency is to take measurements just on either side of it, maybe just a couple of hertz off on the lower side and the higher side and averaging, and averaging the, the results. Um, but anyway, uh, when we talk about a normal power factor measurement, we're talk, we are assessing losses at that asset's operating frequency, which is, which is good information to have. Test voltage is as high as the rating of the energized winding will allow, or as high as the power factor test instrument will output, whichever is lower. Uh, power factor is also an averaging test, so it is most effective when you test the smallest sized insulation systems possible. And this really isn't uh, there's really not too much you can do about this one because there's only going to be uh, so much reduction in size that you can make, make happen. 
and the readily accessible Power Factor Plus plans uh, are going to already, by their nature, assure that the tests you are doing on the, are on the smallest components that you could possibly uh, make accessible in the first place. Just keep in mind, though, that sensitivity to problems is going to decrease as the size of the insulation system increases or when a problem is localized. So, for example, if you had a huge single-phase auto transformer that had a tertiary which was inaccessible, uh, which forced you then to energize, tie all the winding terminals on that uh, transformer together and energize the whole winding and set up this uh, potential difference across all the materials in that transformer, this, you should lower your expectations of how much screening you're really doing for dielectric problems because the sensitivity is gonna be a way reduced in that case. <clears throat> Assessment of power factor now, um, that's all about comparison and um, comparison to benchmark values, to previous values, and as a last resort to limits. However, only, um, and I should say too, trending is the preferred analytic method uh, that requires more than one previous result. And when you are comparing results, you have to make sure that these have all been normalized to 20 degrees C base so that the comparison is valid. Uh, any, um, just based on our present, present day knowledge about power factor, uh, this underpins a second recommendation to pay attention to any change in a line frequency power factor result. Now, I haven't talked in this presentation about capacitance, nor have I talked about its evaluation, but this is another important aspect of power factor testing. It just simply isn't a focus of this presentation, so it's not included. Uh, Mega has plenty of reference material available to get a wider uh, understanding of components of a uh, power factor test and, and its analysis. And this was just one webinar, a previous testing tactics webinar that you might want to visit if you want to learn more. And then finally about power factor, just sharing the fact that you know, the industry does have standards bodies that publish uh, limits for power factor uh, oil, on oil fill transformers that depend on their voltage rating you can see over uh, any unit greater than 230 kV, uh, the limit for new transformers, half percent, the serviceability age limit is 1%, meaning any, any transformer that tests above this uh, should be immediately investigated for cause and, and so forth. And I said that was above, that's actually for below 230 kV, for above and equal to 230 kV, the limits are a little bit more conservative. I would, again, not recommend using limits as uh, something to compare to unless you have absolutely nothing else as reference materials. This is, these are only set up to give you gen general expectations of where uh, a healthy build transformer uh, and the materials in use today, uh, the power factors that the, the, these materials should, should use for you. So if there were no screening deficiencies with power factor testing, then we'd be ending the presentation here. But obviously, that's not the case. So the deficiencies of power factor are, are all summarized on this slide. Averaging is a double-edged sword. Ultimately, it's a key to power factor su success. Why it works in certain scenarios like bushing testing um, when insulation resistance doesn't work as well. Namely, it's why you can see a localized problem. Uh, but there's a darker side to, to averaging that we need to talk about. Um, it does require asset to be small, otherwise the averaging effect may make it harder to see a problem. And here's an example of a classroom, three students versus 10. A change in the performance of a student is easier to see in an average, if you're only looking at an average, with a smaller, smaller classroom. <clears throat> And then you have, and then uh, when you have signs of deteriorating health, it's hard to discriminate between localized problems uh, and general deterioration. In this illustration here, um, both both averages equal 90, less than a perfect 100. But you can't tell by just knowing the average 
whether or not that average is due to a condition where generally and why you know across, across the entirety of the sample everything has deteriorated a little bit or if everything is still in as new condition with the exception of one localized region in the sample that's pulling that average average lower and knowing that average alone again doesn't allow you the possibility to determine and differentiate between the the problem actually present which is a problem because localized problems would call for a different uh, next step than widespread deterioration was and quite frankly if you saw a class average of 90 you wouldn't be alerted thinking that there was anything wrong that's still a really high score however you can see with a localized problem that that average of 90 which seems seemingly good belies the fact that you've got one really severe uh, problem in that sample um, power factor is also not acutely sensitive to certain problems at line frequency which we will explore in the next slide and finally when a problem is indicated by power factor results next steps aren't typically well guided. <clears throat> so on this um, slide, uh, we're looking at tan delta versus the moisture um, for typical core form new uh, and in-service transformers. So on the y-axis of this, of this figure, we have dissipation um, factor at 50 hertz uh, plotted on a logarithmic scale. And then on the x-axis, we're showing percent moisture and cellulose. Uh, and we're looking again at the dissipation factors measured for a new transformer in blue and a service age transformer in red as they increasingly become contaminated with moisture. So as they become contaminated, what's happening to this tan delta? So what can we see from, from, this, um, from this illustration? Uh, well, first, you can see that the slopes of both the, the service age and the new transformer are, are relatively flat at low moisture levels. Uh, in this region, maybe up to um, just almost two and a half percent, um, dissipation factor isn't increasing. It isn't rising vertically uh, very noticeably as moisture is increasing. So someone who's relying on dissipation factor or power factor at line frequency as an indicator of a problem will be unaware that moisture contamination is present and trending upwards. It's not until the moisture in paper is at least two and a half percent that the slope marginally starts to increase and then maybe at three and a half percent when uh, the slope really increases at which point then you could say dissipation factor has a heightened sensitivity to moisture. And another point, in spite of its eventual sensitivity to moisture, that seems to occur on average maybe around 3%. Uh, even when I'm at 3%, notice that dissipation factor or power factor is still only, uh, is still only a half percent. <clears throat> and for perspective, operators become weary not only once you pass that 2% mark in moisture and in, in, moisture content and by two and a half percent they're typically scheduling a processing unit to uh, dry the transformer and here we've got uh, units at three percent that are only showing uh, what's generally considered to be an acceptable power factor limit of, of a half of a percent <clears throat> of additional note is the divergence um, or separation of the two curves. You notice how they come together at higher moisture concentrations, but at low moisture levels, they're they're quite different. And how and what this means is that a single uh, dissipation factor value here at 0.3 percent, uh, how much moisture that's going to indicate is going to depend on the condition of of the transformer. Is it in as new condition? which would correspond to over 2% moisture levels, or is it service aged, which may be indicating uh, that 0.3% may be indicating, you know, only maybe a half percent of moisture, which could be a very quite dry unit. And this presents a challenge since it's not a straightforward task to say, okay, well, my unit's service aged. Well, how do you know? You can't rely 
on years in service as an indicator of how aged the insulation system is. It's highly variable and depends on the environment, you know, its exposure, the maintenance, uh, this, these all factor into aging. So in summary, this lack of sensitivity to, in this case, moisture at 60 Hertz means that if I see small changes in my power factor dissipation factor, then these can be quite significant. Uh, and it's also why trending, again, is the best analytic tool because those changes are really important to observe. The only challenge becomes filtering out other variables that could be influencing your test results. And the one a, a note that comes to mind is temperature. <clears throat> so let's talk now about the explorations that have been in the decades of making into opportunities to enhance this in-screening uh, capabilities of power factor testing. And principally, this includes three variables that we can change when it comes to performing power factor testing. Uh, the one thing I'd note before I talk about each one, you know, very quickly here, is at the hub or the intersection of all these tests is the traditional power factor measurement performed at line frequency. Uh, that's the power factor measurement that we are used to performing, you know, at the highest acceptable test voltage, at the as found temperature. So we're not throwing away power factor. This is just taking some variables that we can change in how we're setting up our test that can reveal some very insightful information and elevate the screening capabilities of a power factor measurement. So first on the list is voltage. And Power factor tip-up tests or step voltage tests have been around for a really long time. Um, typically, you, you don't use them, the power factor tip-up test, as a screening test on assets that don't have the proclivity to, to develop a, a voltage-sensitive problem. But, uh, but the test is revealing when suddenly a voltage-sensitive problem manifests. The nice thing is, um, Today, there are what are called VDD capabilities, voltage dependency detection. And um, that is essentially a screening filter that works in the background when you're doing a normal power factor measurement. And this capability will alert a user where normally I may not be doing a power factor tip up measurement. Uh, it will alert if, hey, we're detecting um, some anomalies in this measurement that you know, essentially make us feel as if it would be in your best interest to do power factor tip-up test. Um, the, uh, the next variable that can be very insightful to introduce into our test is, you know, temperature. Not that we have a lot of control over temperature. Um, however, it does, temperature does provide a lot of insight into the behavior of insulation. Um, it's widely known that power factor changes with temperature. Uh, as temperature increases, power factor typically increases. Um, but what you see is on an insulation system uh, that's in distress, the sensitivity to temperature is exaggerated. And so that becomes a very helpful diagnostic or in sometimes just a, 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 hey, I already see the problem here. I'm also seeing this ridiculous temperature sensitivity that just reinforces my belief that I have a problem. And then finally comes a big one, and that's frequency, and that's what we're going to explore now. <clears throat> so uh, let's move on to a discussion then about narrowband uh, DFR testing. And I want to make uh, I want to make clear that uh, you know. Uh, Narrowband DFR isn't unseating the power factor measurement. It's just a continuation. It's an expansion of a power factor test. So a power factor test, again, we're making it near the line frequency. We're applying the highest test voltage amplitude possible uh, and making one, and one, one measurement. With a narrowband DFR, we're simply repeating a power factor measurements this time using one low voltage amplitude uh, as our test source, and we're repeating the test at many different frequencies from 1 to 500 hertz. So narrowband DFR testing should be very familiar to anybody who's been doing power factor testing for some time. Uh, it's essentially power factor testing 
uh, with a modern day power factor test instrument. This connections are the same, the test procedures are the same, the insulation components that we're, we're measuring, CH, CHL, CL, C1, C2 are all the same. Uh, it just happens to be that modern day power factor test instruments are providing a lot more data than their predecessors do. So for every insulation component that you're measuring, in addition to providing that 60 hertz power factor value, um, a modern day power factor instrument will sweep a narrow range of frequency and provide additional power factor values for that component, for example, for CHL. These extra measurements take a few more minutes, maybe just over three more minutes per insulation component, but the value of the test, the benefits you get from doing this extra testing far outweighs the cost of a few minutes more per component. And this slide just uh, um, captures all of the benefits of narrowband testing and including this together with a, a traditional power factor measurement. We've talked a lot about how power factor aligned frequency can be insensitive to moisture contamination. Well, narrowband DFR testing is very sensitive to moisture uh, and solves a lot of general sensitivity problems inherent with aligned frequency power factor tests. We also talked about how when an insulation component becomes very large because of power factors averaging nature, uh, it becomes really difficult to, if not impossible, to detect a problem. Well, because we go down in frequency in a narrowband DFR test to one hertz, uh, this allows us a far better ability to see an emerging problem in a large insulation specimen because at these very low frequencies uh, we are able or not we're able conduction current any resistive current flows through that very large insulation specimen it makes up a larger component of the total charging current so power factor isobar over i sub t with that numerator increasing i can see it better and when i start trending this data I can certainly spot any changes in that resistive component a lot better at one hertz than I can at, at line frequency. <clears throat> Another problem, I talked about the, um, the power factor being sensitive to temperature and how we can't even assess our power factor until we make sure we're comparing apples to apples, everything can uh, corrected to a 20 degrees C base. Well, the question is, how are you going to do that? And we're going to talk about that when we talk about ITC. But just know that narrowband DFR is a big part of the answer of how you're going to do that. And then lastly is just basically as screening tests, both of these, power factor, narrowband DFR is an expansion of power factor. So as a screening test, you know, we don't have any lofty expectations that we're going to walk away pinpointing any problems or knowing exact uh, values or anything like this, they're screening tests. However, it is nice once you finish a test to have a general sense of what might be the problem so your next steps are, are better defined. And unfortunately, with a line frequency power factor, unless you have like terrible results over 1% where you can, anybody can say, yeah, you know, there seems to be a problem here. Deciding what the next step should be can be kind of elusive. And narrowband DFR is going to help ease the determination of what you should do next. And so um, how is narrowband DFR delivering all of these uh, better screening capabilities? Well, for background, uh, I'm showing you this figure that comes straight from Megger's classic book, A Stitch in Time. And this, what this is showing me is a bunch of currents that I'm measuring through an insulation sample. Uh, but what you should know is that I'm applying a DC voltage to this insulation sample. And even with a non-varying uh, voltage source, you can see that initially anyway, the current through my insulation specimen does vary, does vary with time. You can see it starts at 0.1 seconds up to 10 seconds. So this is varying with, with time. This is also showing you each of this total current uh, components. Uh, so you've got absorption current, capacitive charging current, and conduction or leakage current. This is a resistive current, and then you've got some capacitive currents. And it's showing how these vary with time as well. 
although they vary in time very differently. None of these are like all following together like a family of curves. Um, now, we'll be talking about when we talk about power factor testing, we're in the AC world. Uh, so if you remember that, um, you know, frequency is simply one over a period, which is given in seconds, you can see that, hey, if I apply a DC voltage uh, for just a very, very short amount of time, then that this region of this uh, diagram is going to correlate with higher frequencies. Whereas if I apply a DC voltage for a very long amount of time to where leakage current stabilizes and, and approaches uh, to the total current, which eventually uh, starts to reach steady state here, um, if I hold that voltage for a very long time, then that correlates with lower frequencies. So what I would tell you is that lower frequencies, and I mentioned the importance of one hertz and test, doing power factor tests at one hertz, you can see that conduction current becomes a very large part of the total current measured at, at these very low frequencies. Um, and again, that's the resistive current, the loss. And if I'm dealing with a huge insulation system uh, that I'm charging, so huge think huge capacitance when I say huge insulation system, uh, and, and a, a very, very tiny leakage current uh, representing losses, by going to a lower frequency uh, where that leakage current is a lot bigger proportion of the total, I can start seeing a lot more detail. And that's very helpful in a screening capabilities bill. <clears throat> so these changes with frequency uh, in all of the currents on the previous slide, that results in a change in power factor with my test voltage frequency. Because after all, power factor or dissipation factor is the ratio of some of these currents, right? So if the if resistive currents changing with time, total charging currents changing with time, then these ratios change with time. Power factors are, are, are power factors going to be changing with time, aka changing with frequency. So now then, if I look at a whole series of power factor, or in this case, dissipation factor measurements um, made and then, uh, and then connected in as, into a curve as we're seeing here, we can see that we're looking at something from very, very low frequencies all the way up to you know, 1,000 hertz, so higher, much higher frequencies. Um, you can see that power factor in the neighborhood of a traditional line frequency power factor test of 60 hertz, uh, what right around here. I mean, this is we're dealing with power factors of under a, under a half a percent, like we're used to. But if we start, you know, moving down into lower frequencies, you can see at one point for this particular transformer, they're all going to have their unique DFR. Uh, or dielectric frequency responses here. But in this case, for dissipation factor, you see we're over 100%, which uh, dissipation factors, resistive current over capacitive current. So it just means that, you know, we're the, the current that we're measuring is comprised of more resistive current than of capacitive current at this, at this frequency. Narrowband DFR is the screening version of a full DFR uh, test, full DFR measurement. So one of the things that happens when we um, forego the use of a true DFR measurement, which is required for, for this full picture here, we lose modeling capabilities in a database. So again, we won't be getting specific moisture estimations or oil conductivity intelligence from a narrowband DFR test. Narrowband DFR test is the screening test version of the full DFR, and narrowband testing is performed with a modern day power factor uh, test instrument. <clears throat> so here is showing uh, the correct boundaries for a narrowband DFR test. Uh, um, shown as one hertz all the way up to a thousand hertz. And maybe one additional feature I you can observe on the narrowband DFR curve is the trough on the curve represents uh, the lowest power factor or dissipation factor value along, along the curve. And that will be interesting um, to look at if you start trending results, because what happens is as a insulation deteriorates, you'll see that this trough 
will start moving in frequency along as the condition of the insulation uh, gets worse. But I would need previous uh, uh, test results in order to determine that. And previous test results aren't required in order to get immediate value, screening value from a narrowband DFR test. <clears throat> But what we should talk about um, before we talk about how we go about evaluating and what we're looking at on this curve is how we display the narrowband DFR test results. Um, narrowband DFR data is primarily reviewed um, as we see it here as a curve rather than looking at a numeric table showing, hey, at this frequency, the power factor was this. At this frequency, the power factor was this and so forth. And, and what you have to be cautious of with visually weighted tests uh, is how you display data. That's that's very important because what I'm showing here are um, uh, DFR measurements on on three low voltage bushings or four actually low voltage bushings, um, and it's the same exact data. I've just displayed it uh, in one case using a linear axis uh, for frequency. Uh, and on the other case, using a logarithmic display. Uh, for higher frequencies, there's not much of a difference between the two displays, but in the region that provides most of the information, um, it's a lot easier to, uh, in fact, it's impossible to see any detail with a linear display. So the preferred display is to view narrowband DFR test results logarithmically. And then from there, how do we go about assessing um, to assessing the information? Uh, so for transformers, we're going to be performing narrowband DFR tests, taking that extra three minutes per insulation component and generating the three curves. Uh, and then once those are temperature corrected, uh, we want to analyze these for non-typical results. So what are we looking for? Well, one of the first things we do is, hey, let's identify the line frequency power factor on our curve and just see what that, that is. We, we've had knowledge about what it should be for years and years and years. Let's, let's take a look. Just make sure that you're assessing the temperature corrected uh, 60 hertz power factor or 50 hertz power factor wherever you are. Um, then I want to take a look at the slope of the curve through that 60 hertz. If that slope is positive, then that's going to indicate to me, hey, this is this is healthy insulation, and I don't need to be fearful that, gosh, am I really seeing, is this screening well enough? Am I seeing everything I should should see? Positive slope is, is a good sign. But more times than not, you're not going to see too, too many positive slopes. You're going to see a lot of what look like flat slopes, very slightly negative slopes, and sometimes, unfortunately, you'll see flat-out negative slopes. And so the decisions about what to do next when you run into those types of slopes are going to be greatly aided by the behavior at the, at the one hertz frequency. And I'll show you some examples. So next, I want to find that trough on the curve if it's possible. There's some uh, cases where, you know, in the frequency range, one to 500 hertz, say, that trough is not going to be on the curve. And that's OK. But if you can find it, find it and note its frequency. If you've got previous data, look at where that trough used to be on previous data. Is it the same point or has that changed? Um, of course, being sensitive to, I've got to look at narrowband DFR test results that have both been corrected to be able to compare movement of that trough. Uh, and when I say I've got to, you know, don't, don't get fearful that, oh gosh, how do I correct for that? That, that is all aided through the use of, of software. Um, and then we look at the end portion of the narrowband DFR curve, higher frequencies, so up around 500 hertz, and, and assess the behavior of that tail. When you start looking at enough of these, you're going to get to the point where you kind of ignore the tail. Especially when you see one that looks unusual, it will definitely stick out at you. And I've got a picture, a case study in here to show you what I mean. And then finally, um, but uh, last but not least, note this behavior at one at one hertz. Um, and uh, if you have previous tests, and then these are ideal to see what the one hertz uh, behavior was before. This one hertz is a very sensitive region, so you'll you'll notice any any changes will be magnified uh, at the one hertz level. 
So here's typical then uh, narrowband DFR curves for the three components. CHL is the one in red. And so if I find the 60 hertz, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 around here, I can see that, you know, gosh, it's really a low power factor under 0.2%. My curve does exhibit a positive slope. Through through this um, through this region, uh, same with the CL and my tails uh, look normal. I don't see anything aberrant about them. They're not jumping up to some crazy power factor over here. So that that's all looking well. And then I come to my CH, and and that one is uh, coming down to the 60 hertz region, and that one's slightly negative through it. Does that mean I have a problem? Well, that's what I mean about going back to your one hertz data and taking a look at that. Generally speaking, if it's less than one percent at one hertz, uh, you know, you, do you do you need to react to this? Absolutely not. So another example, this is a CHL narrowband DFR um, curve, kind of approach the assessment uh, the same the same way. Now here's one that's uh, showing showing what how problems start to emerge. You know, you, you can see here you come down to around 60 hertz. Um, it's certainly looking like it's maybe around a half percent, which isn't terrible. But I do have a negative uh, slope through here. I come back to my one hertz, and I'm I'm at 10 percent power factor. So this one would definitely be a cry out for, hey, this screening test caught something, it's time to do some diagnostic testing. And the one that would cut diagnostic test that would come to mind would be, hey, let's do a full DFR test. So that's what was done. And uh, you can see on this full DFR measurement, here is our one hertz value, just to see that yes, these in fact correlate with uh, the narrowband DFR results. And you can say, yep, in fact, it's 10% power factor at this one hertz measurement. So with the use of the full DFI test instruments, modeling capabilities and curve fitting and whatnot, uh, it provides for us an estimated moisture and it says, yeah, we have a definite moisture problem in this unit, 3.4%. So uh, a dry out uh, needs, to be, uh, needs to be scheduled. So there's another case study. Uh, we've got uh, a curve, um, and we can see that at, in this case, their line frequency is 50 hertz, and it's it's a great number, 0.27 percent. And this is what I'm talking about. A lot of times you'll see uh, narrowband DFR uh, results like this, where you know it's like, well, what's that slope doing? It's really hard to to, to formulate any opinion about this one and, and what you should do next when you've got a slope that's looking like this. So this is when it's nice when you go back uh, to the one hertz and you, you get a sense of, of where that's at. And in this case, we're up uh, close to maybe 1.8%. So it doesn't look um, fantastic, but it's not jumping up to 10% in that previous example either. So this is a case where I'd probably advise to be more vigilant. And um, full DFR tests were performed on this unit uh, anyway. Um, and you can see at one hertz, it does correlate to that 1.8% power factor. And uh, the ultimate assessment uh, is that moisture is estimated to be around 2%, uh, so not, not fantastic. Uh, borderline getting to a level where you may want to think about uh, scheduling a dry out in its nearer future. And the oil conductivity isn't fantastic, but these are very in line with a service stage uh, transformer. So um, one thing I should pause and point out at this um, time is then if we revisit this whole idea of using just our line frequency power factor test as a screening tool, uh, I, I want to point out that, hey, you know, it's, it, it really isn't sufficient by itself to assess dielectric health. In both of these examples, um, the line frequency power factors are the same for the three, in this case, three units being tested, in this case, two units being tested, uh, they're exactly the same. And on this one in the, on the left-hand side, the dissipation factor, or tan delta in this case, is 0.5% um, for all three cases. 
However, when you go on and do, well, um, this example, full DFR um, measurements, it gives you, it really pinpoints and, and, and characterizes what you're dealing with as far as insulation systems go. In one case, uh, these with a three identical line frequency power factor, in one case, one needs, one needs a dial, it's wet. That's good oil. One is service aged, um, and you know everything ages, and sometimes service age means just keeping an eye on it and monitoring it so that you don't have any further changes, and eventually you cross a threshold where you have to do something. And then in this case of this red one, I actually have a very dry transformer, but it's got extremely aged oil that needs some mitigating um, activities. So. Um, the one on the right, same thing, and we've got the same identical power factor at one frequency of these sister units. In one case, however, uh, it turned out to be a unit that had moisture contamination, a three and nearly three and a half percent, while the other one was quite dry at one percent moisture content. So be careful with a line frequency power factor. On the other extreme of it, before I move on to bushings, I want to just uh, use this one slide to reinforce the significance of testing down to one hertz. Uh, and the messaging around this would be that one, it, it's a good assist this one hertz value with the evaluation of these flat and negative slopes. Uh, because oftentimes you're like, well, you know, it's kind of borderline and having that extra peak at the one, what's going on at one hertz helps you decide, okay, this is what seems to make sense. To do next. Uh, again, that sensitivity in large insulation systems. I mean, if I have a huge auto transformer and I just can't segment up this insulation very well, this is going to increase my chances of seeing a problem emerge, particularly if it's a localized problem, uh, by being able to see down at this very low frequency range where conductive currents anyway are dominating my measurements. And then um, we, there's a utility, and I'll do a shout out to them. I took this from Transformers Magazine, a July issue on the effects of overload on transformers. This comes out of Southern California Edison, and Robert Brazil has been doing a lot of research um, through the years uh, in his distribution transformer repair shop, and has uh, had an interesting slide that I just uh, uh, so really, um, that shows how one hertz is so sensitive to the effects of long-term overloading. So they simulated some overloading. What they have graphed here are the CHL, um, not not the CHL itself, but changes that are progressively happening in CHL um, with loading of the distribution transformer. Uh, when you look at one hertz versus looking at 60 hertz. And you can see at 60 hertz that, you know, as we progress along in the loading of this distribution transformer with time and applying different temperatures for different, you know, for longer and longer times, you can see that a lot, much of the impact from this overloading isn't visible yet at line frequency, but it's certainly, this is showing how much uh, progressively uh, how much change in CHL uh, is occurring from where you start from. And at one hertz, it's really obvious. So quickly moving on to bushings. <clears throat> bushings are, are interesting um, and, and in, my, in, a, in a lot of ways easier because you've got uh, presumably, you know, at least maybe three that are, are similar, similar make and manufacture. So, the, you know, with that convenience of testing three similar bushings at a time, the expectation is that the, the narrow band DFR response for the three bushings should be looking similar. They have the same loading profile, same thermal profile, exposed to same environmental conditions. So just like with uh, the assessment on a transformer, we're identifying the line frequency power factor after it's been temperature corrected, seeing, hey, what, what does that look like? And then assess the slope of the curve through that point. Uh, again, assess the tail end uh, up at the higher frequencies of the results. Note the behavior at the lower frequency. And if you have it, compare to the previous. 
Mm, so in this in this case, and and uh, I started to show it before, um, I show narrow band DFR data for four low voltage bushings. And the slide on the right is simply after that data has been collected for temperature, the temperature uh, at which it, it was it was measured. So um, this this would be the uh, the test results that I would assess, uh, not not the uncorrected for temperature uh, ones. So in this uh, case, bushing X3 uh, certainly is starting to stand apart. Uh, and however, if we had not tested down back to this one hertz again, this kind of detail becomes really difficult to see. So when we're above 10 hertz and beyond, I mean, it's really hard. It would be hard to differentiate and see that X3 was having uh, a problem. This is just a couple of uh, uh, results from an interesting case at a cogeneration plant. Uh, these were three really high voltage bushings, 230 kV. Uh, and these are the narrowband DFR results that were obtained. This is a case whereby the tail is really aberrant, really you know, high, high power factor values sticks out from the other two. And what it turned out to be, here's a picture of it. This is the top terminal. So here's the top cover bolted down onto the bushing below. And it was zoomed in so that you could see hopefully this um, detail where you know, there's some, some, uh, some kind of pitting, some kind of discharge occurring right here. Uh, and it turns out that this was a loose connection. Uh, and that was causing the tail of the narrow band. So what I typically would suggest you is, is the type of it, um, problems you're looking at when you get to these higher frequencies, partial discharge really related issues, um, loose connections and, and things, like, things like this. Incidentally, after tightening down uh, this terminal, uh, they repeated the test and they, they were much more in line. I mean, that silly tail uh, behavior went, went away. Uh, they went ahead and replaced H3 though, because this was a very important installation. So they didn't want to take any chances of maybe what that damage had. Had done. Uh, so the thing though, and, and this goes back to how you display data when you have visually weighted analyses. Um, if I change my scale so I really zoom in and looking at these, I mean, probably nothing to, to chase here for sure, not. But bushing H1, you can see that the curve of it is really different than the other two, which are parallel to each other. And this could be indicating that, hey, maybe the tension or the torque used on and tightening that thermal down on this one, maybe just ever so slightly, slightly off. Although that could be a bit of a, a bit of a chase for me. Um, the last uh, bit that I want to talk about in this webinar uh, is, a, is a short few slides about uh, individual temperature correction or ITC. Um, we already talked about the fact that, hey, when test temperature changes, it's going to cause a change in power factor, even though that the, the insulation itself is completely the same insulation and it doesn't, you know, over the course of a temperature change, change its uh, changes. Uh, its, its characteristic health, that's still, uh, it's still unchanged condition, but just by the act of temperature changes, the electrical behavior of that insulation uh, will change such that the power factor usually will increase. Uh, and so it's important, therefore, that when I start comparing power factor results to previous, that I'm always correcting back to a 20 degree C reference value. And the problem is, for a long, long time, uh, we always use lookup tables to determine what temperature correction that was based on a number of, of things. Um, you know, things we pick off the nameplate values uh, in, in addition to the insulation oil temperature. But, and this has been spoken about widely, uh, IEEE and standards groups are no longer recommending the use of these lookup tables uh, because it's been determined that how a how an insulation behaves with temperature is is highly dependent on the condition of that insulation. So you can't uh, there's no one size fits all in correction curves. Um, out of this out of all the years of of DFR study, um, one thing that that was noted um, in Meber is that the shape of the dielectric response. Uh, the shape of each of these curves at different temperatures 
are basically the same. They don't change uh, just because you're going up in temperature. They move for sure, but they move without bending. They, they move uh, kind of stoically and, and they get shifted and pushed around. And that's true whether it's very low moisture or if it's a very wet transformer or any variation in between. And so that's a very important feature because it means that um, if we can determine what's called the frequency shift factor, uh, then the DFR can be shifted. Even if we say test it at 50 degrees C top oil temperature, we can, sh if we know that frequency shift, how far we shift it to get it back to an equivalent 20 degrees C spot, then we can say, oh, we can look up what the um, 60 hertz power factor would be at 20 degrees C and say, hey, if we waited for this transformer to cool down, would it be would it suddenly be looking a lot better for power factor? So that that's a, was a really interesting uh, revelation. And so uh, the way that uh, um, that we go about calculating individual temperature correction is basically applying Arrhenius the Arrhenius equation, uh, and and it's essentially equal to let's see e to the negative activation energy. Uh, times the difference in the inverses of the two absolute temperatures divided by the Boltzmann con constant. These are all um, known values. Um, the, you, you'll have the temperature you just measured at as film temperature. That's T1, uh, and you know you want to uh, convert that to something. Or you want to identify the frequency shift back to 20 degrees Celsius. So Going to plug in some known values and determine this uh, what, what this, this value here is. Then once I know that, and I'll show you I'll show you with an application. Then I can determine how how far this curve shifts, and I can find equivalent uh, 20 degrees C values. So let me just give you an example. It's a lot easier because uh, I think I, I that was sounding very confusing to me as I was saying it. But if I test a transformer and it has a top oil temperature of 35 degrees C and performing narrow band DFR testing, then I'm going to get the green curve on the right over here only. I'm not going to get these other three because I'm not testing again at any other temperatures. Uh, and, it, and if I, so I get this narrow band DFR information and then I come into 60 hertz and I see that, gosh, my, my power factor is somewhere over. 0 0.01, and that's 0 0.01, the number, not percent. So if I multiply by 100 and turn that into percent, I'm over 1%. So I want to know, well, if I let this unit cool off, then what's going to be my equivalent 60 hertz power factor at 20 degrees C? I mean, does it improve from over being over 1%? So since I have this narrowband DFR, uh, these values in hand, I need that in hand in addition to the equation, then what I'm trying to determine is, hey, what is my 60 hertz going to look like at 20 degrees C? Well, that's simply going to equal 60 hertz divided by the frequency shift. And then that, so whatever, whatever hertz value this is uh, at 35 degrees C. So in other words, I find my 60 hertz value at 20 degrees C somewhere on this narrow band DFR curve. I just don't know which frequency is the equivalent 60 hertz value, or not say the 20 the equivalent 20 degrees C value at 60 hertz. One of these frequencies, or one of these points at one of these frequencies is giving me the power factor that I would measure at 60 hertz and 20 degrees C if I waited for it to cool down, but which one? And so if I plug in all those, uh, all the information I have into that Arrhenius equation, I'm going to get uh, 0 0.177 in this example. So 60 divided by 0.177 tells me, aha, uh, I can find my equivalent 20 degrees C value, at, uh, you know, 60 hertz value at 339 hertz on this curve. And so I can say, okay, well, that's way over here. Uh, so presumably, let's see if I come over here, gosh, that's what, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4. It's, it's definitely below 0.5% uh, power factor. 
Uh, and, and so, I mean, that's essentially how the individual temperature correction is working. And the beauty of this is it works on any insulation system, no matter its condition. So last example, uh, this was a transformer uh, tested. Uh, here are the narrow band DFR test results. Uh, and I can see that uh, you know, I've got through my line frequency, I've got negative slopes in each of the cases and I turn to one hertz and they're really all uh, very, very high. So I'm not very happy with this. My narrow band DFR results are telling me I have a problem. But then I, I look at what I measure for power factor, line frequency power factor, and here are my results for the three insulation components. Now, uh, a table was used, a lookup table to correct these measure at 31C down to 20C, and these were these were my new values. And and yeah, you know, for this power transformer, I'm not I'm not too happy with with these numbers, but particularly CLs starting to get really up there. Um, if I go on, if I move on, and I want to say, let me accurately correct this for its condition. I already know that it's not in great condition. Uh, let me accurately correct. Well, then again, I use that Arrhenius equation. I determine my frequency shift factor is 0.2757. So I did, I'm able to say, well, I have my uh, 31C results. It's on, it was on the previous slide. So I can find my 60 hertz, 20 degree C equivalent value at this, uh, at the 217.6 frequency. And so after collecting by the individual temperature reduction, these are the real values for that temp for that transformer. So it tells me, had I waited for it to cool off to 20 degrees C, uh, these would have been the results I would have gotten. And you can see that they're a far cry from what was guesstimated by this lookup table. Uh, anytime you get the truth um, separating from the average by such a difference, and that's just another vehicle to tell you that, gosh, I have extreme temperature sensitivity with this one because it, it's a lot different looking than what an average transformer may may look like that doesn't take into consideration the condition. So that should be a red flag as well that, gosh, you know, this transformer's got some problems and I need to, to delve further into determining what's going on. So to summarize, and I apologize if I if I run over a little bit here, but uh, to summarize um, this slide, our figure more or less summarizes it all. Um, there are two time, and I'm not going to go through the slide, but I do want to point out that there are two timelines represented here. One along the x-axis indicating the timeline for each respective test emergence, and these tests are uh, electrical. Uh, uh, mostly, I mean, I do show uh, DGA popping up here. I don't show oil quality tests, but they're primarily uh, electrical dielectric screening tests for transformers. This, this shows the progression as the years pass when these uh, test screening tools came became available. And then on this axis here, on this Y axis, uh, kind of from a top down approach, shows uh, the stages of a problem's uh, maturation. So in other words, at the top here, the problem is non-existent. And then we get to the, pro the, the level at which narrow band DFR testing sees the problem. And this is, a, is, showing, um, is, is showing signs uh, that the problem is there. However, those signs and symptoms are not yet uh, uh, manifesting under operating conditions. So at under operating conditions, you're not going to see this problem yet, but narrow band DFR uh, sees things uh, earlier in their development than any other screening tool. Um, well, if that problem matures, and then suddenly the sim is exhibiting symptoms under operating conditions, then you've got a, some additional tools that are kicking in that would potentially see a problem in the insulation system depending on the nature of that problem. Um, and I leave this figure on here because it summarizes advantages of each of these tests. Um, you know, so for your future reference, since you can get a copy of this presentation later. And then last slide, or uh, yeah, last slide of this of this uh, of this um, topic. Um, the one to five hundred hertz narrow band DFR testing elevates power factor testing to a very powerful screening test for transformers, bushings, etc. 
uh, gives you early warning of a developing problem, better moisture sensitivity. It confirms that, hey, my power factor looks good. Is it really good? If, if narrowband DFR testing confirms it's good, then you can sleep well at night. It reveals when a seemingly good power factor result really isn't so good because that happens a lot. It also reveals the temperature dependence so that you can correct the power factor to its 20 degrees C base accurately. And therefore you can assess power factor data and compare them to previous and know that, hey, if there is a change, I really need to do something about it. It is a familiar test. It's the same instrument, same power factor instrument, same setup, uh, as a line frequency power factor test. Uh, the only thing is the test time takes approximately three minutes more per component. And then, so if you just bear with me, I, in my final slide, I would like to just say a few words about several solutions, uh, power factor, narrowband DFR test solutions that MEGA provides depending on your needs. Uh, and so this one on the far left is our Delta 4000. It is a dedicated, uh, capacitance and power factor test instrument. Of course, it performs, you know, ex um, another dielectric screening test, right? Exciting current test as well. Um, this instrument has narrowband DFR testing capabilities from one to 500 hertz, and that range is important. Um, it includes features such as the individual temperature correction and also that voltage dependence detection that I mentioned during the presentation. The TRACS is a, our multifunctional solution for transformer testing. Uh, as well, it provides several common um, substation testing functionality, uh, including, uh, for example, many tests on circuit breakers and uh, instrument transformers, things like this. Uh, it, it, it contains, um, it, well, it's driven with this concept of apps, so it gives the user a feel of it changing into different test instruments depending on what your need is, which is nice because it doesn't come across like this very overwhelming set with too many settings or anything. It morphs as you go from app to app to app to give you the feel of a, of a different instrument, but the same controls and the same features so that the use is seamless and you don't get tripped up on having to learn new softwares and things like this. It also performs uh, power factor testing uh, with a TD component not shown here, sorry. Um, but that, that um, allows you to perform narrow band DFR testing from one to 500 Hertz. It, it, it has ITC feature, the voltage dependence detection feature, et cetera. And then finally, uh, we've got the IDAX. This is MEGR's full DFR instrument when you need further clarity and when your screening tests call for you to perform a diagnostic test. It provides a moisture estimation, for example, uh, the power factor dissipation factor, oil conductivity, and it's got unique features in it that, that differentiate in the market, make it both extremely fast and, and at the same time highly reliable in high interference environments, which is really important when you start doing full DFR on instrument transformers and bushings. So we're really excited to be celebrating over 20 years with the um, since the first commercially available DFR, this IDAX was introduced to the market. Um, but that should conclude my presentation. Thank you so very much for you, uh, listening in, for your attention. And yeah, I wish you safety foremost and success. A uh, really close second with your uh, power factor testing programs. And Michael, I will pass it back over to you now. Thank you, Jill. Uh, so at this time, the presentation portion of the webinar has officially concluded. Uh, in the interest of time, we will be responding to the questions that were posted during the webinar in the email we will be sending out with the certificate uh, copy of the PowerPoint and webinar early next week. If you have yet to put in any questions for Jill or any of our panelists, we will be receiving those at the broadcast at megger.com email that the invitation for this webinar was sent. Uh, so please send those out to us uh, anytime between now and mid next week. We will try and have that attached to the email we will send out again with the certificate, copy of PowerPoint, and webinar. 
The webinar will also be held at us.megger.com slash webinars under the completed webinar section for you to view again or share with a colleague. Uh, we thank you all again for your time. You can join us next month for our webinar, Fundamentals of Generator Protection Testing. The presenter for that will be David Beard, Senior Relay Applications Engineer. At the end of this webinar, a, uh, a survey will pop up on screen. We would greatly appreciate it if you could take a couple minutes to provide your feedback so we can continue upon further uh, webinars. On the survey, there is a field where you can also request a demo or a quote on any mega products. We thank you again for attending our webinar and hope you have a wonderful, wonderful weekend.